Summary of the Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat by Oliver Sacks. This book is split into four parts. Each part is made up of a number of short case studies about some part of neurology, which is the science of the nervous system. In part one, Sachs talks about neurological diseases that can be seen as problems with how the brain normally works. He says that most neurological illnesses are usually seen as some kind of weakness by the medical community. But Sachs says that the paradigm of mental illness as a deficit is too narrow. First, it doesn't take into account disorders of the right hemisphere of the brain, which can't be easily understood as a deficit in a specific brain function. Second, it doesn't give people enough credit for their ability to find ways to compensate for mental illness and make up for the deficit. Patients who are talked about in part one include Dr. P, who has a rare form of face blindness that makes it hard for him to tell the difference between his wife's face and his own hat, Jimmy G, who has Korsakov syndrome and can't remember anything for more than a few seconds, Christina, who loses her sense of proprioception and can't feel her own body, Madeline J, who has cerebral palsy and says she can't control. Sacks how patients, whether consciously or unknowingly, find ways to make up for their problems throughout part one of his book. With Sacks's help, Christina, Mr. McGregor, Mrs. S, and Madeline J train themselves to work around their brain problems so they can live mostly normal lives. In part two, Sacks talks about brain diseases that can be thought of as too much of a certain thinking process, not too little. By doing this, he talks about action and how a neural excess affects a patient's day-to-day -day life, instead of just talking about the part of the brain that is sick, which is what most neurologists do. In part two, Sachs talks about a number of people who have had Tourette's syndrome. Before the middle of the 1970s, Tourette's was a problem that not many people knew about. It was also thought to be very rare. During that decade, though, doctors slowly learned that Tourette's was a very common disorder. Sachs says that neurologists don't understand Tourette's because most of the tests they use to check patients are too clinical and mechanical. Sachs also talks about illnesses that could be seen as positives. For example, some people who had syphilis said that it made them feel alive and full of energy. Sachs also talks about patients who deal with their diseases by equalizing themselves with the world. This means that they try to make up for feeling confused or out of control by changing their mood or behavior. William Thompson, who, like Jimmy G, couldn't remember anything for long, tried to make up endless, contradictory names for himself to feel like he still had a self even though he couldn't remember anything. In part three, Sachs talks about cases where a brain disorder changes the way a patient sees the world in a way that could be seen as visionary, magical, or happy. He talks about two women who said they heard loud, beautiful music in their heads. He thinks that these women were having seizures in their temporal lobes. He also writes about Bhagawandi P, a young Indian girl who got a growth that would kill her and became nostalgic and happy, as if she were having a strange type of seizure. Another person Sachs looked at, a man named Donald, killed his child while high on PCP, but later said he had completely forgotten about it. Later, after getting a head injury, Donald said that he had seen himself kill over and over again in almost perfect detail. Donald learned how to live with his new condition. He couldn't get rid of the dreams, but he found ways to deal with them. Hildegard of Bingen, a famous Christian saint from the 1200s, is the last person Sachs talks about in part three. Sachs thinks Hildegard may have had recurrent seizures that gave her intense dreams, which she saw as messages from God. Sachs says that if you knew everything about Hildegard's health, you could say that her dreams were just caused by her body, but you could still respect her creativity, intelligence, and religious devotion. In the fourth and last part of the book, Sachs talks about how he works with people who have serious mental problems. At the beginning of his career, Sachs didn't want to work with people with intellectual disabilities because he thought it would be sad. But over time, he's come to appreciate the beauty of how people with intellectual disabilities see the world. The main idea of part four is concreteness which is a way of looking at the world that sees reality as a set of real things instead of a set of vague ideas. Many of the patients with intellectual disabilities that Sachs talks about in part for have a strong sense of link to the real world. 
it's almost as if their minds make up for the fact that they can't think in general terms. Rebecca was one of these patients. She had a very low IQ, but she also had a great talent for poems and poetic images. She could describe how she felt in complex material terms, and she found ways to use words to make abstract feelings feel real. Martin A., who had intellectual disabilities, knew almost everything there was to know about the past of Western music and had a deep understanding of the music of Johann Sebastian Bach. Sachs also talks about the twins, John and Michael, who had problems with their minds but were very good at math. Sachs ends his part on the twins with the sad fact that John and Michael were later split up and lost their ability to do math, which had been their greatest source of happiness. In the last part of part 4, Sachs talks about his work with Jose, an autistic boy who was very good at drawing. Sachs noticed that Jose drew to connect with the outside world, even though he was shy and didn't talk much with other people. Sachs says that society should stop putting autistic people on the outside and treating them like outsiders and learn how to help them develop their special skills. About the author. Oliver Sachs was born in England, and in 1960 he got a degree in medicine from Oxford. After that, he did an internship at Mount Zion Hospital in San Francisco. As a neurologist, he worked at a hospital in the Bronx. There, he met a group of people who had been unconscious since the sleepy sickness epidemic of the 1920s. Sachs's study on these patients, which ended with him giving them the drug L-Dopa to wake them up from their comas, was the source for his 1973 book Awakenings. Since the 1970s, Sachs has written many books about medicine, such as Migraine, 1970, An Anthropologist on Mars, 1995, and Hallucinations, 2012. He has also written two autobiographies, Uncle Tungsten, 2001, and On the Move, 2015. People knew Sachs as a smart, but often extremely shy, man. Sachs didn't know he had face blindness until he was well past middle age. This condition made it so he couldn't see his own face in the mirror. In his last book, On the Move, Sachs talked about his sexuality, which he had kept secret from everyone except his best friends. He died in August 2015 from a tumor. He was one of the best-known and most-loved science writers of the 20th century. Hope we summarized it fully and you liked it. Please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel so that we are motivated to create more videos.